Thanks, Henry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, good morning and welcome again to ISURA 2012. Uh, as an educator, but firstly a learner of ultrasound regional, we all go through the same process. And uh, although we're not in Europe this year and the world, the Euro Cup is taking uh, place currently, I'm always reminded of Gary Lineker, who is uh, an Englishman for the national team many years ago. He described soccer or football as being a very simple game. 22 players chase the ball around for 90 minutes, and in the end, Germany wins. <laughs> and it's, it struck me that as I uh, sort of progressed from the learner to teacher stage, there were thousands of us doing ultrasound regional. We were teaching for countless hours, and yet we were still challenged by not being the winner of watching our students struggling and struggling and struggling in the patient setting. So I'm going to try to present a way of conceptualizing and providing a context for learning um, in a very complicated excuse me, environment. So my objectives are quite simple. We're going to generate some interest, hopefully, promote some discussion, and provide you with some practical insights to how to make your experience as both a learner and teacher hopefully better. <laughs> Disclosures, I do some educational work for both ultrasonics and Zanari in Canada. If you're here, I hope you've asked yourself, why do I want to integrate ultrasound into my clinical practice? I'm already skilled. I already have good outcomes. I think over the last couple of days, you've seen that we can improve our outcomes as we become better and more skilled. And then if we buy into the first notion, how am I going to do it in my unique setting? All our practice settings are different, different surgeons, different patients. Uh, we need to ask ourselves what is going to work for us specifically. Questions that come to my mind routinely are, well, if I want to integrate it, the question is why? And clearly, we start to see improved patient outcomes as we go through the process of developing our uh, practice patterns. There's objective data that continues to emerge. Uh, there's our clinical subjectivity, whereby I know that as an ultrasound regionalist, I'm much more effective and much safer for my patients than I was as a nerve stimulator, <coughs> regional-based anesthesiologist. And this is, it also caused me to reflect on our previous innovation over the centuries, from anatomical-based practice to nerve stimulation, and now to a very dynamic, real-time assessment of what we're doing. At a professional and personal level, I'm also interested in being innovative for new patient care strategies. So outpatient catheters, keeping people pain-free longer, while not only in hospital, but at home. Because we're certainly in Toronto uh, feeling the effects of healthcare changes on a, a daily, weekly, and yearly basis. And we have had an interventional renaissance. As a resident in the 90s, the notion that someone was going to do a regional anesthesia fellowship was absurd. It was largely a dying frontier. Even in a center like Toronto, common resident complaints were, it's the weakest part of the curriculum. So given the change that's happened in the last 15 years, it's been truly a turnaround and what I feel is a, re a renaissance for our profession. And that's what I'm going to speak to today, specifically the profession. In the short time we have, I'd like to really tailor um, ways to contextualize the need for ultrasound as well as how to make it work. So guidelines. As a self-regulating profession, we have the obligation and the duty to try and maintain our practice. And agencies both in Europe and North America, are looking at ways to provide a structured curriculum or a structured assessment to make sure we're maintaining our standard of practice. So we have to acknowledge that as the years go by, we will become subject, as we are now, to other uh, governing bodies, ways that we can meet their requirements. Even in North America, um, ASER was commissioned to find a scope of practice for what we do. And Brian Seitz uh, led a paper which looked at the common challenges or things that we'll need to establish in our own practice to be effective with ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. The first three items are really uh, content, knowledge, management issues. The fourth is a little bit unique in that it goes into the area of patient care where we put our patients at potential risk. So the first three we can do uh, quite safely anywhere independently. And I want to emphasize that the skills perspective, which is this, can be acquired through the use of models that don't put the patients at risk until basic competencies have been achieved. So as it gets to education and practice, uh, recent publications show that most frequent reasons for not using ultrasound 
are what we all experience as learners or when we teach new learners, that there's lack of training, equipment is tough to acquire, and that we have pre preference for traditional techniques because we're familiar with it and we're willing to accept the outcomes that for so long we've come to experience. And the challenges, likewise, they follow pretty straightforward from that. And this one, these two sort of go hand in hand, and we're now seeing performance time dramatically decreased with the skilled ultrasound user. But this is a real problem still for many, many people once you move beyond the academic care setting. So uh, Brian cites also uh, in another paper tried to characterize common learner errors. And I don't think there's anyone in the room who's either a novice or experienced ultrasound user who hasn't seen or seen people or themselves had challenges with one of these aspects. And although that was uh, published in 2007, five years later, these are still the challenges that new users face. So if we think we we have good cause to integrate it. How do we want to integrate ultrasound into our practice and specifically to achieve your own goals in your unique setting with your patients and equally importantly with your surgeons? Well, in thinking about Gary Lineker's comment, I've tried to... Someone's controlling this. I've tried to break this down into three different conceptual parts. The first part being our sonoanatomy, which is knowledge of both the anatomy as it's portrayed in a two-dimensional framework, the machine, and how we're going to integrate our physical space. The second component is modeling, and this is purely a technical skill component, where if you're in plane or out of plane, how are we going to bring the needle to the exact location that we deem as appropriate, as safely and as effectively, without the usual Swiss cheese phenomena where needles are being passed and you can't visualize it, which is a concern for all of us. And finally, the third component is once you're comfortable in a safe setting with both your scanning and your, mod your needle skills, the clinical integration is where, as we've discussed over the last day or so, you place the needle in a known anatomical field, and now you watch in dynamic time where the fluid is going, where your local anesthetic spread is, intraneural, extraneural, wherever you want to be for that patient and your comfort. Sorry, I'm not doing that. Um, so, sonoanatomy, very dynamic. When we looked historically at what was taking place for a supraclavicular block, the clavicle static, the sternocleidomastoid static, pulsatility of the artery, and that was all. You drop a needle. Now, as we go through it, I'll play this brief clip again, you're seeing first rib, you're seeing pleurisliding, sliding, you're seeing a completely hyperdynamic vessel, and the plexus itself is moving at relatively great speed. This, isn't, this is just real time. So a lot was going on that we couldn't appreciate from our previous techniques. The best way to learn sonoanatomy, and it sounds very mundane, is to sit at the machine, learn the knobology, no time pressure, and use your forearm. Muscles, nerves, vessels, bone, it's a very simple, yet rich environment for scanning. You don't need to be in the brachial plexus. If you can scan from your distal arm all the way up to your axilla, following the same nerve around bone as vessels are coming in and out, you are really an accomplished scanner in that regard. And then switch to your non-dominant hand. You have to have a degree of uh, ambidexterity in this to be really effective, because you can't always needle or scan the same position on the other side of the body. The second component that I find quite interesting is the modeling aspect of how do we want to keep the needle in plane or out of plane and direct it exactly to where we want to be in a very safe way. The first notion when we go back to sonoanatomy, you may do the block for your junior colleagues and it's easy for them to scan. Take a few minutes, let them scan the anatomy, get used to handling the probe, managing the patient, and getting a familiarity with the various anatomical forms <coughs> you'll see on ultrasound. Once we get to needling, I'm very particular that I want the juniors to demonstrate that they know where the needle is in location to the probe before they go any further. The stress they feel is equally 
is equivalent to the stress you feel and the stress the patient feels as you're struggling with a block with repeated attempts. It's very uncomfortable for everyone. So many models have come up over the years. Commercial models, homemade models using all kinds of animal products, uh, different targets. There's no one right model. Whatever you feel is useful in your setting is great, as long as you can determine that it has the ability to challenge the learner in terms of complexity and maintain um, your objective of, of needle to target localization. And you can see these are getting quite sophisticated with pretty sophisticated price tags. I never see patients that really look like this, so I'm not sure I'd know what to do with a rectus. And, uh, and most recently, uh, ultrasound and regional anesthesia training model. Very sophisticated and an excellent learning tool, but for basic skill sets, has been shown years ago in simple, simple yet complicated procedures such as fiber optic intubation, you don't need a high fidelity mannequin. A simple box with a few holes, the learner will clearly direct where they need to go with repeated exposure and show tremendous learning. So in going from this very high fidelity setting, I wasn't sure how I was going to capture your attention, so I thought I'll show you a model that is sort of naked, pale flesh, quite alluring for a Sunday morning. This was developed um, in an attempt to find something that I could use easily in the teaching center. There was no risk of contamination. I could provide hypo and hyperechoic targets. I could make them smaller or larger. I could bury them so that in the beginning, as the learner needs to see the trajectories to orient their probe in a needle, I could make it with increase in complexity to challenge them and really understand if they were being able to interpret the plane in which their needle and the target was going. It was also quite cost effective for my department, so it wasn't really an issue. And to show you what, well, I'll show you a few live demonstrations, but our video demonstrations, but the effectiveness of any model, it doesn't matter how complex, what the fidelity is, as long as you can translate from the learner in the safe, non-clinical setting to the clinical setting, you've really achieved your goals. And simplicity, to a certain extent, is quite elegant um, as I watch people pick this up year after year. And again, I can't emphasize enough that you don't need the sophisticated models for a more basic interventional skills such as needle guidance. The model must demonstrate both in-plane and out-of-plane te technique possibilities, so whatever model you're using, um, classic in-plane along the path, beam path, and then out-of-plane where you're going to see the tip represented as the hyperechoic signal. In this clip, it's a large wood dowel, so you're seeing about an 8 millimeter dowel and a chewy being directed through the tofu with ongoing refinement of the needle to make sure that the tip is always in position. Using the hard targets also gives you an advantage that the user has a bit of tactile sense of when they're in good proximity, uh, unlike our nerves. Similarly, this is a one millimeter wire target with a 22 gauge needle. And as the individual brings the needle in, every so often they should sort of stop, redefine the tip, the projection, and successfully demonstrate that. Uh, I didn't publish this, but I thought I might as well try to make a vascular model because more and more people were getting into uh, vascular access using ultrasound in, in our institution. So this was the same tofu block, but I passed a tube through it, uh, tied one end, and pressurized with a syringe the other end. So once again, applicability for both in-plane, um, such as uh, radial art line access and the very challenging patient. This is a 20-gauge angiocath in plane penetrating the vessel, and then the arterial wire being thread through the catheter. And most commonly, we're doing our IJs at St. Mike's out of plane, as I expect most people are. This was the out of plane appearance of penetrating the artificial vessel, passing the wire, and then as always confirming in a longitudinal view the position of the wire prior to placing the catheter. And we've had very good experience with people getting familiar with depth, gain, Doppler capabilities through very inexpensive, simple models like this. 
So we can do these quite safely ourselves on patients. This really needs to be done in a very controlled, non-stress setting, uh, especially for, uh, for new learners. It is quite challenging to see 22 gauge needles, deep tissues, um, so it gives a sense of confidence and procedural skill that is important. And this, unfortunately, takes time. Um, you may deliver your needle exactly where you want it to be to the established ner nerve, but as we've seen with very skilled clinicians, defining your spread, defining the location at a very, very detailed scale uh, comes with time um, and ongoing uh, experience. So to go back to this setting, just a, a, hopefully a brief clip. Again, very dynamic. This was pushing the anatomy around such that the needle, as the individual was uh, advancing, was actually coming in and out of view. So there's hesitation as they try to pick up their tip before they get too close. Um, in years past, we typically did these blindly. I couldn't imagine ever approaching uh, the plexus and the supraclavicular area again with just the anatomical plumb bob technique. I find it a little bit frightening. So fortunately for both teachers and for learners, uh, the future is going to get brighter, uh, no pun intended, and easier. From the initial developments of the pioneers 10, 12 years ago, it's incredibly easier to see our anatomy. Vast improvements. Um, the processor technology has gotten better. The um, transducer technology has gotten better. The needles we're seeing now are just so much more reflective in contrast to what we used to use um, that it's become much less daunting, even bringing new people into, uh, into the clinic. And of course, increasing access to the equipment courses and expert tutors. Uh, this sort of forum, and ISUR in itself, is, a, is an incredible uh, opportunity for everyone to learn from each other as colleagues and both as students and teachers. So I'll encourage you to make use of all the resources here over the remaining time because it truly is a, a phenomenal experience. As I'm not going to get the music, I'm going to close there and just say thank you.